Yep. Hello. Welcome to our bookshelf to talk about All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Toes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I also will tell you this just because I found this out. Her name is pronounced Taves. What? Uh huh. T O E W S is Taves? Yeah. I, um, so you know, I don't know if it is like a, a connected to like a Mennonite ness, but oh. like that is, I think, like whatever the etymology of this name is. I had found this out because, you know, I became a fan of hers with this book. Um, and I've also read her book, Women Talking, and I had listened to mm. some interviews with her, and that's when I found out that's how you say her last name. So I'm just I, passing this along to you because I, I, I was I'm happy to have like, it because I've actually watched interviews with her and didn't get that information. So I must have watched different interviews where they said her name wrong. <laughs> and she didn't. I only that. listened to interviews. I didn't, I actually oh. don't even know what she looks like. Oh yeah, there's a couple. There's a couple nice video interviews on on YouTube. She's really sweet. I because I reached out to her to see if she would do an interview for this, and yeah. she um, emailed back and was like, "I'm so sorry. I'm in the middle of writing my next project, and I'm just like in that zone." And I was like, "I get it. Don't worry about it." Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Please keep writing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're like, it's better for us if you keep writing. So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what what um you're our guest editor for November and what did you like how did you go about deciding what book you wanted to put forward for November so I think you know when we were talking about this and and this kind of like initiative in general and like the the sort of purpose I think of like a book club or communal reading collective reading I I just thought of this book just kind of popped into my mind. Um, it, interestingly, I didn't read this till somewhat recently, even though it came out years ago. A friend of mine who's a novelist, um, who actually just put out a wonderful book called Cleopatra and Frankenstein. Her name's Coco Mellers. I was amazing. out to dinner with her and she she mentioned All My Puny Sorrows. And I was like, oh, I've, I've never read it. And she was like, what? She was She was really shocked I had never read it. Huh. And she was like, I feel like it would be your favorite book. And then, and and truly it was like, I, I went, I bought the book the next day and read it. And then I wrote her and was like, you were right. <laughs> it, is my, it is like one of my favorite books. Um, so, you know, I, I always enjoy that when I discover a book, like, you know, not immediately upon its publishing. And for me, I think the reason I wanted to pick it, um, it's just because it's it's a novel that it really stays with me and I think about pretty mm. frequently. Um, I keep coming back to it and I keep turning over the characters and, and the themes as I've moved through my life. And I um, I just think it's a, a wonderful book, like ripe for conversation and dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I love also that it's funny. Um, I mean, I've, I've found the book, I find yeah, it very yeah. funny. Yeah, it's interesting. She just walks an incredible line of like, she's dealing with such heavy subject matter. And then, you know, two seconds later, everybody's doing things that make you laugh out loud while you're reading. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're obviously, you know, collectively as a, as a world, we've gone through this, this grief experience the last few years. And personally, I've had my own grief experiences. This is like, this book really felt like a deep and kind of honest under understanding and exploration of like loss and grief and how it is. Also, yeah. There's so much humor too. That's a part of it. Yeah. I mean, humor is a lot of what makes us human, right? Like it's like animals don't joke. They don't you know they play but they don't like tell a joke you know so it's like at least yeah. as far as we know so it's like an interesting <laughs> part, as far as I know <laughs> but um it is an interesting part of just being human you know like it is part of what sort of separates us out from other creatures on this planet which is that like there is this mechanism we have to deflect or make a joke so that the weight of something doesn't crush us or you know it's like weirdly a survival mechanism I guess 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, as someone who, since I was very young, was very, very scared of dying, Mm. like as a concept, right? This, this book kind of spoke to that in, in a really deep way for me. And I guess I just wanted to, to expose as many people as possible to this novel. Yeah. Well, and so for someone who's watching who like hasn't read the book yet, uh, what what would be your sort of two minute pitch of what the story is? Two minute pitch um, is that, so this is a novel in my mind, primarily um, about two sisters and a mother. Um, one of the sisters is this, you know, sort of world renowned classical pianist who is clinically depressed and kind of continually engaged in suicidal efforts. Mm -hmm. Um, The other sister is sort of shaking her fists and body at this situation, wanting her sister who is her kind of, you know, I think they have this, this really deep bond that stems from being raised in a very strict religious Mennonite community in Manitoba in Canada. Um, And so they've kind of been through this really oppressive, like insular hell together. They both emerged. Um, And so Yoli is like, she wants her sister to stay on earth, on planet earth with her. Yeah. And so I think in many ways it's about this, you know, this conflict between these sisters, this deep, deep love, this respect for autonomy, but also a desire for togetherness and community. And then, you know, the third player in this, the third big player in my mind is their mother, Lottie, who is, for me, was like, she's kind of the hero of the whole thing. That's how I felt. I'd really be curious, like your take on that. That's interesting. um, Yeah, you know, she is this utterly resilient um seemingly kind of unflappable woman who's just been through so much hardship and so much death and loss and manages to retain this like kind of I don't know like joie de vivre this like irrepressible um love of life and yeah it's about it's about their relationships and, and what ends up happening. And for me, it's just about like, you know, some of the big themes in in my mind are like, you know, what is, what is home when we leave Mm. a place? Where are Mm. we going? You know, that's interesting. I was like looking back at the book um, this morning, just, um, and I remember, did you ever read um, Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson? Mm -mm, I haven't. So that, um, so that book started, I think the first line of that book is my name is Ruth. And I had watched an interview with her and she was like a Melville scholar. And so like that book was kind of in response to the first line of Moby Dick, which is call me Ishmael. Oh, wow. That's a complete side note, but I went back and looked at the first line of this book because I forgot and it actually struck me, um, and I'll just read it out loud here. Yeah. So, so the first line is, our house was taken away on the back of a truck one afternoon late in the summer of 1979. And I thought that was really interesting because I was considering as I was, yeah, just, you know, getting ready to speak with you, how much I think home, returning, leaving, mm. where are we going is just a part of this. Oh, Um, wow. Yeah. I just have goosebumps. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, that's the first line because Yoli feels like Elf is her home and and she's watching her home be taken away by depression, really, you know? Yeah. And I think with Elf, I think the question is, she wants to leave Earth, but where does she want to go? And to me, like, that is such a, like, I know. And it does feel like she wants to go somewhere. It's weird because it's, it's such a tricky... I feel like, I, I don't know, I, I, obviously, I feel so lucky that I don't face that kind of depression because I cannot imagine how painful it would be to, to live with your mind telling you those things all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and because I don't have a mind that does it, it's so hard to imagine what that's like. You know, it's so difficult to imagine what that must feel like for for people. And and yet the way that Miriam approaches that character, you never feel like she wants to not exist. You feel like she just wants to be somewhere else. Right? Totally. Am I and I don't no, quite I think... know how or why, but it's like and in a weird way you get wrapped up in it as the reader because you start to get torn as to like, you know, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, I mean, spoiler alert for those who haven't, um, you know, Elf really doesn't want to be on earth anymore. And she's asking her sister to help her to no longer be, you know, she's asking to help be, be able to die. And it's a really horrible, hard, terrible thing to ask a, a sister to do, but she also does asks it out of love and out of wanting to not die alone. Um, but it does feel like she's asking her to just like take her somewhere and drop her off. Like, it doesn't feel like she's asking her to kill her. She's, it feels like she's saying like, just take me to this other place. And you kind of get wrapped up in that as a reader where you're like, well, we should maybe take her to a place where she's happier and she feels better and that she's not suffering. And, and then you're like, wait, but we only know about this life. We only know about this planet. Like what, how do you, how do you? I don't know. Like you start to wonder if she knows something that we don't or that she's like <laughs> enlightened in some way that, that most humans aren't. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it was interesting too that both um, Elf and Yoli are creative for a living. Mm. And I thought, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure you relate to this, but so much of creative work, and I can speak to this as a musician, is about like, going somewhere you know yeah. so like and and bringing people to another place you know you sort of create you build these worlds and I think it's interesting that you know Yoli is is a writer and so she's building these these written worlds Elf is a pianist she's building these sonic worlds and they're both kind of like they're they're building home <laughs> you know they're yeah. in these different ways because the the way the setting in which they grew up was was so inhospitable yeah to them yeah and you know I wonder for me I, I I wrote somewhere and I can find it like this question that I just had in the middle of the of reading the book I think for the second time like what does it mean to return to like return to a person, to a place. Um, what does that mean? And like, you know, in my own life, my whole family left my hometown. Like everyone left. No one lives there anymore. Yeah. And so I come back like on tour for shows, but, you know, I don't have a house to go to. I don't right. have. And so I just think I, I in my own experience, I've thought often yeah, what, you know, we're all searching for a sense of home, obviously. It's yeah, not a, I mean, a novel it's, thought, but, no, but yeah. also as artists, like we are always moving around. Like we're, we're always, I'm in that situation now. I'm in New York working and I rent an apartment and it's like, you know, you do the best you can to guess from pictures if you're going to feel at home or not. And then you get there and you're like, gosh, nothing works. And then like the stove is weird and there's nowhere to put anything down next to it. And it sounds like dumb things, but it's like, you just feel like everything feels a little off and you, you don't have any way to have a routine to something or be able to just do something on remote control. And, and I find that, you know, the first stretch of time I'm anywhere new, I end up being like, screw it. I'm just going to like buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon <laughs> and try to make it feel like home because I feel like I can't fully creatively function unless home feels somewhat like home you know like there I need these like touch points of things that feel like well these are the pillows that I like and this is the kind of blanket that I like and I have a robe in the bathroom and I you know it's like mm -hmm. dumb little things but it those things start to go like oh this now feels like my space instead of some random space that I had to rent to to just sort of survive in you know and yeah. it means more and more to me, I guess, as I've gotten older too. Because when I was younger, I didn't really care. I was like a kid, you know. I was like, I'll, I'll live in a hotel room. I don't care. And then you, you know, you get older and you go through more stuff in life, and you're like, no, I like need to feel pretty good at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think what's to me why I sort of view Lottie as like the the hero of the book, mm -hmm. the mother as the hero of the book is like, and this this is this could be my own personal bias, but. 
Lottie, like anywhere is home. You know, I think yeah. and at the end of the book, like, again, not to, not to spoil anything, but we see Lottie like just able to just stay curious and, and flexible in, in this way that yep. to me just felt so, it felt so beautiful and so human. And I'm not saying there's one right way to live and we're, we all have our different like burdens, but I just, I just saw her as this, yeah, kind of like the beat, like the thumping little heart of the book. Yeah, I think you're right. I didn't think about it because I was so, um, I don't know. I was kind of not traumatized was the wrong word because I wasn't traumatized. It's way too dramatic to say it that way. I'm traumatized. I'm traumatized by what the sisters were going through. I, I was very taken by it. I was very like captivated by it because I am super close to my own sister. And so I think, you know, you immediately put yourself in, in the, in the shoes of these characters and I'm going, Oh my God, I don't know what I would do if this were the case, you know, like, and thank God it's not, but it's like, I I think I was so taken by the intensity of what that was because it, it, if I were in Yoli's shoes, I would feel so trapped, right? Like it's like you love this person so much and you want them to be close to you. So you want them to want to be here, but then you're seeing that they're suffering and they're telling you this is the only way for them to not be suffering anymore. And that if you really, really love them, you would give them this. And you're like, but I do really, really love you. And I don't want to give you that, <laughs> you know? And, and, yeah. and then there's also the other side of it too, of like, you know, you don't know what, what could shift in someone's brain chemistry to like move them past that place in their life. So then you're going, oh my God, like, what if, what if I'm not there to stop them from ending their life? And then you know, two months later, they could have found a cure or the, or the right combination of meds could have solved it. Or, you know, it's like, I just, I really identified, I think with how trapped and scared I would feel if I were in Yoli's position. Um, yeah. And how all consuming that would be. Like, I was very aware that Yoli's life was very centrally tethered to her sister because of the situation, you know, and that she wasn't, she was sort of stunted in a way because she wasn't going to grow her other relationships weren't going to grow past knowing that at any moment she could get the most devastating phone call of her life. You know, I think, I think that's a really apt word choice, the tethering, you know, when you're mm -hmm. in, in proximity to someone in active crisis, there, it is that there's a, there is a tetheredness and yeah. there's a way in which that that type of a crisis it just sort of subsumes all the other narratives you know and it's so it's also interesting to watch Yoli flourish at the end of the book I mean there's something so you know bittersweet about that you yeah know, she, she, and I and I liked um you know there's parts of this book that are sort of like you know epistolary and Yoli's writing to her sister and I yeah. I loved the choice to end the book um, with, with that kind of communication. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was, you know, because that, I don't know. I, I felt like it was a really tender and loving way to acknowledge that, that tetheredness. Yeah, totally. And it, yeah. And it also just like, I've been really lucky to not lose a ton of people in my life. You know, I, I've had mm -hmm. a couple of like really hard losses and I don't have any grandparents anymore, but it's also, it, you know, with, they lived to be a good old age and had good lives. It wasn't like, you know, something traumatic out of the blue. Um, but like, I think about I, the end of the book and the way that she was writing to her, made me think about how, I don't know. It's like, we just don't understand the cycle of life. I don't think really like we've lost sight of something in like the way that humans have developed and civilization has developed past like hunter gatherer times or whatever, because it's like, I can, like, I still feel like my grandparents are here, you know, mm -hmm. and they've been dead for a long time. I still, I feel the shape of them here. I still think of them. I still share things that with them energetically, even though they're not here but it doesn't, I don't feel like they're gone. I feel like they're here, you know, like that they're still around because their memory is still here. And then the way this book ended made me also feel like 
that's kind of true for everyone who's ever lived. We're just sometimes unaware of it. Like it feels like there is this impression that every life makes on this planet. And just because we aren't necessarily aware of every single impression doesn't mean that impression isn't here. And do you know what I'm trying yeah. to say? It, so it, I really felt, I felt Elf's presence in a very alive way, even though Elf is no longer alive. Totally. And I think, you know, I, from my own personal perspective, it's a little bit of a different situation, but my, uh, my dad was a very serious addict and died from that when I was 14. Wow. And I, you know, I, I, substance abuse and suicide are different things, sure. um, but there's, you know, there's, I forget what page it is, but, um, they're you know talking about Elf's situation and sort of she she lacks a tolerance for the world. Yeah. You know? And I've after my after my father died, I was very, very angry. And you know, there's a there's a really gripping conversation that Elf and Yoli have where Yoli says, Did you ever think your purpose is to be here for me? Oh yeah, that's right. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's this like, it's this really, I mean, it's like, you know, and this, this novel is born of, you know, the, the lived experience of, of the author. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think it's grounded in, you know, a, a great deal of authentic experience, but man, I feel like there's a lot of people out there right now who are shaking someone by the shoulders and yeah. going did you ever think your reason to f to fucking like stay alive or get it together or is <laughs> don't leave me yeah like, I'm scared to do this thing yeah. I'm scared to be alive like life is hard and I need you and I I remember in in my own experience very much feeling that way as a teenager just being mm. like but I need you yeah you know and I and I as I've gotten older and really considered my father's experience as a, you know, a fully Formed cognitively yes. equipped <laughs> yeah. person, God, I have so much, I have so much more tenderness, you know, mm. and, and so much more capacity, um, to, to hold another person's in intolerance for the world. Yeah. And I just thought this was like, you know, I, I just, it really, again, it's, it's, it suicide is different, but there, I think there is a feeling, you know, and so many of us deal with like relatives and loved ones and whoever with substance abuse issues. And sometimes sure. it can feel like you're hell bent on, you know, killing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was for me, this, when I read this, I, it, it brought up a lot of those, those old feelings I remembered having. And so I just loved how we, we watch Yoli be able to say like, I can't believe you're, you want to leave me. But then also at the end, be able to say, now that you've left, I've been able to do these things too. And both of all of it can be true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that the tricky thing about everything in life that so many things can be true at once. And we want so badly to pretend that like only one thing at a time can be true. <laughs> well, and I uh, totally, and like, to me, that's the title. Like, yeah, it's puny and it's sorrow. Like they're both true. You know, yeah. it's just like, it's all happening at once. It's like totally minuscule. And also it's the meaning of life. You know, it's like, yeah. it's just, so I agree with you. Like, I think this book is really in many ways is about this, the acceptance, like this broad acceptance of just, you know, contradiction and tension because life in so many ways is, is that tension. Yeah. Really, and honestly, it's making me think about what you've been saying about the mom, which is that like, she's the one character who somehow is able to let all of that just move through her. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it feels like instead of this immovable force that things have to hit up against that she just sort of like swims through it. Do you know what I mean? Like, like life is water to her instead of brick walls, you know, and it, and even though there are painful times in that water and there are 
tears to be shed, it's like she has this resilience because she's she's buoyant and she's like she's able to like just move through the changes and through through the things that she's experiencing. And that is a really I, I didn't notice it as I was reading it, but it really is kind of an un um an unlikely character. Like I don't think you see that that often articulated yeah. Yeah, in either in novels or film. You know what I mean? Like it's an I, unusual I character. There's... It's an unusual character and there's a, there's like an optimism baked into yeah. her and yet she's also very deep. And I think sometimes culturally we, we associate sort of like um, optimism and waterness as not deep. Yeah. You know, that's that, that there's sort of like, there's a surfacey-ness to that. Yeah, totally. Um, which and and so I just think like to me this this book really exalts all three women, you know, like yes. you you respect and revere all of them for yeah. different reasons. Yeah, at least that was my. I don't know if you felt the same way. Yeah, but. I did, and I also felt like I felt like as much as Elf was clinically deeply clinically depressed. Um, there was also something different that she was experiencing because the way that people tried to sort of possess her talent on her behalf. Do you, mm-hmm. do you know what I'm trying to say? And it was like, mm-hmm. I, as much as Yoli was also creative and she was a writer, there was something different about the way that the manager and the world and the fans wanted to sort of like own Elf and her talent. And the combination of that with her upbringing and then being clinically depressed felt like just like a recipe for never being able to escape the the storm that she ended up in. Do you, do you know what I mean? Whereas like, I, I'm not saying that yeah. that's what caused that the depth of her depression. She was clearly clinically depressed, but like that had to have contributed to um, the disassociation with her body that Elf seemed to feel, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this connects to something that gets brought up early on, but kind of repeats throughout is just this idea of Mm (laughs) non-compliance. And like, you know, it, it, it initially comes up in the context of their upbringing in this, this very religious, um, you know, misogynistic, highly circumscribed environment. Uh, where Elf is just repeatedly, brazenly non-compliant. Yeah. And I think even viewing, you know, opting not to live as an act of non-compliance. Compliance. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just conceptually, I thought that was interesting to think of, like, what it, what is compliance? And I think you're right that, you know, there was there was something ineffable and almost contagious about Elf, right? Like her, her spirit and her talent, like since day one, she's this person who's sort of, and there are these people like this who are lightning rods, I think for ideas and energy and creativity and people are drawn to that. um, And people want to participate in that or want a piece of it or want to, want to feel it. And I do think you're right that there's perhaps like an exhaustion or just at, at a point at which people go, actually, no, yeah, no more, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, which, yes, I, I don't think I had, had thought about Elf, you know, as this, you know, she's so, she's so like urgent and compelling as a person and how other people respond to that and what that what's what that's like to be in this world as a person like that right yeah yeah I mean it's especially if she wasn't feeling joy from her gift you Mm -hmm. know what I mean like if she wasn't feeling joy from her talent or it's a better way to put it and yet there was some sort of obligation to offer that joy to other people despite it not bringing her joy um yeah I can understand the exhaustion that that would have then been added to the depression. You know what I mean? 
for sure. Um, yeah, and it, it was so interesting too, because, you know, I, I kind of have this theory that like loneliness is the the worst, is the, the sort of, it's the, the biggest epidemic, you know, pandemic, whatever of the world, you know, it, it is like loneliness is what drives so many um, dark decisions or um, compromising decisions, you know, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't, we don't mm -hmm. teach people how to, to, we don't teach people how to be alone. We don't, we don't culturally encourage people to embrace being alone at times, you know, it's like this. So what ends up happening is you have all these people who get into panic states of lonely and yet Elf was very at ease in her lonely. Mm -hmm. And it felt like she didn't want the, her loneliness to be disrupted. Do you know what I mean? Like it was almost yeah. like she just didn't, when you've got the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world who's not clinically depressed, like feeling like they're, they want to be around someone all the time. They want to, they want to be meaningful. They want to feel purpose. They want to, you know, we're, we're all kind of on this like hamster wheel of like chasing that those connections to feel alive and to feel like our life has purpose. And she didn't have that. Like she didn't have that thing baked into her DNA or her spirit or, you know, her body chemistry, you know? Totally. And, you know, she was also, she's like an outlier, you know, I think like yeah. there are some people who are just, I mean, not some people, we're all different, but like, you do encounter people who are who are different and then like yeah. in, a, in a really basic way part of this this book is like a celebration of difference yeah. you know and and an acknowledgement and I love like Elf's husband I think actually is able to really understand that oh gosh Elf's husband I wow what a what a man huh you know and I think what I what I thought was really compelling about that dynamic was there was a, there was kind of this radical acceptance of yeah, her. That's the best way and, to put it. Yep. You know, because she was so singular and yeah, you know, and she would never be married if someone didn't have that kind of radical acceptance. Like she's not mm -hmm. the kind of person who I could imagine even caring if she had a partner or not, you know, like it just, so I was actually, I remember when I was reading and I first realized she had a husband, I was like, that's, oh, I didn't, I actually didn't like expect that of that character, yeah. you know? And yeah. then I realized as we got to know the husband character a little bit more, I was like, only he could be her husband. Like only someone who thinks and operates this way and has this kind of like evolved um, sense of partnership could, could be her husband, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. Um, and I, I appreciated like, wait, again, there was just, there was so much tenderness in that relationship. Yeah. Um, there, I just, I just feel like this book is, is very, very tender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and we we're we're living in such a, an edgy world, um, and an angular, you know, like, everything it's it's loud and it's and it's and it's um it's not round it just doesn't feel yeah. round in any way yeah <laughs> um just like the shape of the earth and <laughs> you know I, I I think it's I just whenever I find pieces of like art or creative output that just that feel tender yeah um you know I just Man, I feel I feel very lucky to to have them in my life, and and for me, this this novel is just a real embodiment of authentic tenderness, and just to me, that's that's you know sort of what what I'm what I'm looking for, um, and I think what we need as a, yeah. as a society. I agree. I agree. I feel like that's a beautiful place for us to end. Actually, it's such a great way of summing up the spirit of what I think. Um, Miriam, how do you say it? Taves. So, I believe. Taves. I mean, but maybe now I'm wrong. Now I'm kind of no, doubting. No, it. it just for me, it's crazy because I was trying to find her for so long to see if she'd be interested in the interview. So forever on my to do list, it said, "Find Miriam Toes." 
<laughs> so right. like I was like which which literally I was like that sounds like a book title in itself like find Miriam Toads <laughs> find Miriam Toads find like it was always like the top of my you know like to-do list um so and so I I don't know how long it's gonna take to get Taves uh through my brain after that but um <laughs> but I found her and she's writing so <laughs> okay well listen thank god for that thank god for that <laughs> um well, what, is there anything you're reading right now? Do you have like a new book on the go? Oh, I'm reading, you know, um, I never read Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. You know what? I haven't read that either. I, so interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I've actually only ever read State of Wonder by her, but um, I, uh, yeah, I'm reading, a friend and I are, are reading it together. So I'm reading Bel Canto nice. and... I just finished another Canadian uh, author, a really, a really great novel called The Break, um, okay. which takes place in Winnipeg. Okay. I, so I, I have, I also have a lot of Canadian friends. I feel like I'm like, there's a lot of Canadian energy. I mean, I know you've spent a lot of time. In I, I, I like to think of myself as an honorary Canadian. And I also realized that my dad's mom was Canadian. I don't know why it took me this long to realize that my grandmother was Canadian. So I'm only, <laughs> I'm not that far away from being Canadian. Basically. You're basically, I am, you're basically yeah, Canadian. There is Canadianness in my blood. What? <laughs> Jen, what are you reading? Um, well, I actually, I started this um, spy novel and I'm not going to remember the name because I have so much trouble remembering names of books, even though it's sitting on my nightstand. I should probably just go grab it. Um, but, um, I had just reread actually Filthy Animals, which is, I think you'd really like this if you haven't read it. This is another book that it. we've chosen for the book club and I had read it really early on. And so then I mm -hmm. just recently interviewed Brandon for, for the book club and went back and reread it and was like doubly blown away in the second read of it. Um, Okay. He's just, it's a collection of short stories. He also has a novel that I'm going to go read as well because I just think his writing is so thoughtful. Um, but it's really like five of the short stories all touch on the same characters, but each time from like a different way in. And it really like those cool. five stories span like three days of these those three characters knowing each other. Um, and then there's other stories speckled in and they all they all just deal with this sort of sense of like, he articulated it so well when I was speaking with him that I feel like there's no way I could ever live up to the way he explained it, obviously. <laughs> but um, but the, the characters are all kind of like reaching for a sense of self and are being forced outside their comfort zone to interact with people in order to not be lonely. You know, again, touching on that like loneliness thing. Mm -hmm. And in that activation are starting to like, sort of discover these pieces of themselves and so it, it's very subtle and it's very nuanced but it's his the way that he puts words together it, it just you can find your own truth in the way that he puts words together I don't know how else to explain it do you know what I'm saying like well, he, that's quite an endorsement no I'll read that that, yeah, that sounds no, it's like it, it's like really he's not interesting forcing you to have his perspective mm -hmm. He's giving you mm -hmm. a sentence that lets you find yourself in the sentence. Yeah, I, I don't know how else to, to put it. So it's like, I think that's why I had a completely different experience of the book the second time through, because you can never read something in the same headspace, right? Like, so even though I read it, I think in May, the first time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's been whatever, four or five months. In four or five months, you're in a different headspace. You've, you've lived four or five more months of your life and different things have happened and you wake up in a different mood and you, you know, you have different problems on your mind and then all the words hit you differently. So it's like, even though I had all these pages, you know, tabbed and highlighted, everything I highlighted in the second read was different than what I highlighted in the first read. That's so interesting. Um, I will say I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave us with one thought, which is <laughs> like, so that makes me think there's this like concept I learned about in college that has just stuck with me forever. I learned about it in anthropology class, but it's this, it's this thing called a palimpsest. 
Okay. It's called P-A-L-I-M-P-S-E-S-T. And basically what it, what it is, is like, so back in the day, pre-paper, when people were just etching stuff on stone, because there was no way to erase, oh. um, there was the layering of, of record keeping and imagery, right? Because like someone took the stone and draws like, you know, a cow and some, some <laughs> stuff. And then the next person, like, cause you can't erase it, kind of draws on top of that. So oh. this power obsessed wow. being an idea of like an object where records and meaning are sort of like overlaid. Wow. And you just saying this about filthy animals makes me think like when you reread a book, it kind of becomes, and you take notes in books, which it's, it sounds yeah, like we do. do. <laughs> yeah. It becomes like a palimpsest of your own experience of like yep. the world in this book, because right. You're saying you're highlighting different things. Some stuff might overlap. There's layering. And like, it's interesting to me to think about books um, as vehicles for understanding like ourselves over time if you if you do totally yeah and it's like I mean, there's all this research that talks about like the how your empathy your your capacity for empathy increases the more that you read fiction not nonfiction, mm -hmm. but fiction and I thought that was so interesting that delineation I wish I had the actual statistic to like prove it or whatever but like I I have read several articles that have talked about it and and I was like that is so interesting that because we our brains go, oh, this isn't real. And I can kind of project myself into it. And I can, I can see myself in the story and I can palmsest my way through, you know, mm -hmm. my experience of it over and over again, um, that we actually have space to grow as a person within, within a novel. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so yeah. fascinating. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, you know, God for books. <laughs> God, yeah, geez. I'm like, oh my God. I think, yeah, really, thank God for it. But um, no, I so, I so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank I, you so much for doing this. We were so honored to have you as our first, our very first guest editor. Um, and I loved, it was so exciting to like have a book chosen for us, you know, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's a different experience as well. You know, I sort of, I'm reading so much stuff to sift through to pick because we're really committed to only doing 12 a year, like really one, one book yeah. a month and not drowning people in, you know, 10, 20 options a month. Um, and knowing that like those 12 books really mean something to us. And so it was so exciting to have a book that meant so much to you and then be able to discover it in my own way as well. And it's something I, I had not read and I didn't know, I don't, I didn't even know the writer. So like, it's, I feel like I was yeah. introduced to a whole new, lexicon of of writing you should you should read um women talking which is another yeah. one of her books i think also as a director mm. i think you would find it really interesting because what's it called in tv like a bottle episode or something like yes that? where it all thing? happens in one space yeah it's, I, I, it's, there's a movie coming yeah. out well there's actually a movie coming out of this did you know that i did not know that yeah they made all the puny all my puny sorrows into a, a, a oh. film and I think, Interesting. I think I could be speaking wrong here, but I believe it already exists. It just hasn't come out yet. So oh, it may okay. be coming well. soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, there's that, but I know that they're making a, a movie of women talking as well. I remember reading the screenplay oh. for women talking and um, being very intrigued by it, but I was like in the middle of directing something and I was so busy that I was like oh I should get this book and then I never did mm -hmm. and so then when when you sent all my puny sorrows I was like oh what that was that book I told myself I should read yeah. and I didn't read so I will definitely yeah. check that out yeah also cool. some some compliance themes in oh that yeah too. I mean I could see that just from the screenplay I'd be curious yeah. to see the difference in the in the novel to the screenplay but it was fascinating um yeah. All right, I could talk to you forever and yeah, ever. No, I know, um, I know. So I'm going to let you go have your Saturday. But um, but yeah, we're so, so grateful um, to have you join us and be our guest editor. And um, thank you for introducing me to all my puny side. Thank you so much for having me. And I can't wait to read Filthy Animals. Oh, yeah. I think you're going to really